Actually, if you turn to Genesis chapter 1, read verse 2. Did I get there? 1, 2, and it says, And the earth came to be formless and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Well, formless and empty, those words uh, don't quite convey the meaning. Because in the Hebrew, we have tohu bohu. Chaos and confusion. That's what it means. Chaos and confusion. And we know that from 1 Corinthians 14, uh, verse 33, Yahweh is not the author of confusion, but of love and of sound mind. But today, the world is tohu bohu. If we turn to uh, Yeshayahu, or Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, and I want to read verse 20, because this is what's going on in the world today. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. All our... Uh, our, our whole outlook, our justice system is topsy-turvy. The bad people are given a slap on the wrist or maybe they're praised. And sometimes the good people are persecuted. We, we see people rioting and, and calling for, uh, with this recent Israel-Gaza thing, they're not only, they claim to be there for the Palestinian people, but if you listen to them, their chants are rife with anti-Semitism. Death to all the Jews. Death to all Israel. They, they want to wipe Israel out. And of course, we have an ongoing situation in Ukraine where a lot of people are in the, the depth now of, of a very bitter winter. Some people have frozen to death. With, without utilities, many of them, without running water. They don't have adequate food. And uh, it's a terrible situation. And so we have a situation here of good and evil. And good and evil boils down to conflict and fighting. And that's what we have going on. And, and by the way, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 2 says, there's really nothing new. It's been going on for a long time. But it's getting worse now. I, 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 I think it is. So there's no cl clear distinction today between good and evil. The, the only distinction that's made between good and evil is what's in this book, the Torah. And... Otherwise, the world is polarized, polarized over everything. It's polarized over the Israel-Gaza conflict. It's polarized over Ukraine. It's polarized over our border. Uh, I don't know how many uh, of you might remember an old folk singing group called the Kingston Trio. Anyone? Some, some heads are nodding. Uh, it's before time for most of you. But the Kingston Trio was a, a folk singing group. And, and their songs were uh, um, uh, parodies on what was going on. And in the lyrics of one of them, uh, it was about uh, hate and unrest. Uh, the lyrics were, the Italians hate the Yugoslavs, the Yugoslavs hate the Dutch, and I don't like anybody very much. That was, that was the part of the lyrics of the song. Well, that last phrase, I don't like anybody very much, kind of got me to thinking, this is the root of the problem. People who are consumed by hatred and intolerance are really at war with themselves. And they don't want to admit it. They're at war with themselves. So, we, however, are supposed to be a covenanted people. So how do we approach such things? How do we deal with them? What's our view on this? Well, first of all, if we turn to Tehillim, 
or Psalm uh, 119. I'm going to read verse 11. It says, I have treasured up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that's one of the first things we have to do is treasure up the word of Yahweh in our hearts. And that will strengthen us to keep us from sin. Now, this is the first step. But how do we do that? Well, simply reading scripture. Read it every day. Several times a day, throughout the day. MTOI has a reading schedule that will take us through the, the, all of the Torah parashot and, and the half Torah and, and, and parts of the Brit. Oh, actually, all the Brit. But reading alone is not enough. Because if we turn to Matthew 26, 41, there's, there's three words, watch and pray. We have to watch current events, of course, to know what's going on. But we have to pray about them. And that's the other part of the equation. Now, a lot of people say, well, exactly how should we pray? Well, Yeshua's Talmudim had, had the same question, and, the, and they posed it to him. If you turn over to Luke, Luke chapter 11, I'll read verses 1 to 4. And it came to be while he, that's Yeshua, was praying in a certain place. As he ceased, one of his top ones came to him, Master, teach us to pray, as Yochanan also taught his, his top ones. And he said to him, okay, when you pray. And then we have a very famous passage here. Say, our Father who are, who are in the heavens, let your name be set apart. Let your reign come, let your desire be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into trial, but rescue us from the wicked one. Now Christianity has taken these words and actually made a prayer out of them. They call it the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer. But that's these words are not a prayer. They are an outline of how we should pray. Yeshua said the first thing we do is address our prayers to the Father. No one else. Um, when we, we open the set, I don't know how many of you have a Siddur Okay, uh, art scroll, or whatever you have. Uh, there's a prayer in there. Uh, it's, a, it's a song that we used to go over on the Sabbath, but I quit doing it. It's called Malachi Hasharit, welcoming the angels. Why don't we do that? Because we're not supposed to pray to angels. So, if if we open the Sabbath using a siddur, there's nothing wrong with a siddur. It's rote prayers, but. There's, a, there's, there's room for that. There's a place for that. We don't say Malachi Hasharit. But there are other things. Um, for instance, the Catholics have things like a rosary. It's a bunch of beads on a chain. There's ten and one, ten and one. And the ten are prayers to Mary. Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary full of grace on it. And then one, our Father. So Mary, I guess, is ten times more important than the Father. So, but no, we don't pray to Mary. Miriam, that was her name in, in Hebrew, Miriam, was certainly a good woman, a righteous woman, a virtuous woman, but she's dead. She's in the grave. She's awaiting resurrection, and she doesn't even know it. She has no thought. There's no memory. Right now, I would, I would venture to say that Miriam's body is reduced to s simple dust. There's nothing left. So 
Matthew 6, 7 tells us that we are to avoid vain repetitions. And it's not just things like praying the rosary, but we say the same prayer over and over. Uh, Father, I, I, I have this need. I have this need. I have this need. And the same, the same prayer goes over and over and over and over. And so we have to be careful how we pray and what we pray for. The thing is, what do we pray about? Well, if we turn to Philippians, I'm going to turn to Philippians here. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not worry at all. Don't be concerned, too overly concerned about what's going on in the world. All these bombings and riots and demonstrations and everything. All right. Do not worry at all, but in every matter, every matter, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to Elohim. And the peace of Elohim, which surrounds all, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Messiah Yeshua. It's, it's, it's vital, it's critical in this day and age, with all this nonsense going on in the world, to guard our hearts and our minds. We can become hardened against certain things. We see violence day after day after day on the, on the TV, and it's just, well, commonplace. But we have to guard our hearts and minds that we won't be unduly influenced by these things. So we pray about everything. And let's turn over to James Yaakov. James chapter 4, verses 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask evilly in order to spend it on your pleasures. Now, the reason I brought that up is because while it's important to pray, we can pray amiss. We can pray for the wrong things. So how do we know? How do we know if we're praying for the wrong things or not? What is asking amiss? Well, in essence, it's asking with the wrong intention or the wrong motive. But I jotted down five things here. Something, we could ask for something ex excessive or not needed. Something superfluous. Something we don't really need. If Elohim blesses you and gives you a shiver, you say, well, no, I really want a Cadillac Escalator, a Lincoln Navigator. You're not satisfied with a Chevy or Ford. We can't ask for things that we don't really need. Number two, we can't ask for something that is harmful to ourselves or others. And that could be a, oh, we could open a Pandora's box elaborating on that. But I'll just leave it at that. We could also ask for something that's not morally or ethically right. Or we could ask for something that is beyond our means or ability. You know, Yahweh wants to bless us. He wants us to have a nice house, a nice car, a nice furniture, and, and, and live a nice, uh, productive life, a happy life, but within our means. And so if you pray for things that are beyond your means, that's asking amiss. And also we have to be sure, as number five, that our prayers are in harmony with Scripture. If they're not, we're asking amiss. All right. So, another thing that can be asking amiss is I want. You know, we've all seen uh, little kids go up to a department store Santa Claus, especially this time of year. And the Santa Claus will say, oh, oh, oh what do you want? And the kid will say, I want this, and I want that, I want one thing, I want another, I want a Ford Apache, I want a baby doll uh, house, I want a doll house, I want a... Uh, a Mack truck uh, model, uh, I want a six uh, cap gun. I want, I want, I want. Let's be sure that our prayers are not all I want. All right? We have to be set apart. Now be sure that Yahweh always, always 
hears prayer. He always hears prayer. 1 John 5, 14 tells us that. 1 John 5, 14 says, and this is the boldness that we have in him, that if we ask whatever, according to his desire, he heals us. Now, there, there's a part some people skip over, according to his desire. Father, I, 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 I'd like a new thermos. Is that within your will? Well, it's a, kind of superfluous. But we have to ask for things that are in Yahweh's will and things that are, he will not withhold any good thing for us. But some people take this verse and say, well, I can ask for anything I want. There was a radio preacher one time that has a, had what he called a blessing pact. And if you send him money, he would put you on his blessing pack and you'd get anything you asked for. <laughs> and uh, so we always have to uh, ask within reason. Now, his answer may not be what we want to hear. Rabbi Steve has said, maybe his answer will be yes. Maybe his answer, well, maybe, maybe it'll be no, or maybe it's not now. Maybe it's not ever. But then again, let's go back to asking a miss. When the little kid comes out of the apartment store after his visit to this horrible creature called Santa Claus, uh, they very rarely say thank you. So part of our prayers must be praise and blessing to Yahweh. We must thank Yahweh. We don't always have to go to prayer, say, oh, Father, I have this need and that need. It's, yeah, we have genuine needs, and that's what our, our prayer requests are for that precede every service here. We come up and we present our petitions to Almighty Yahweh, or we give him praise for things that he's done for us. And that's exactly as it should be. Who else can we turn to to answer our prayers? He, we have to praise Yahweh for being the giver and sustainer of life. He takes life, he gives life, and we have to, and, and, and he will resurrect us at the right time, in the right way. So prayer is not always just asking. Sometimes it's giving thanks. It's, it's giving uh, praise. And let's turn to Jacob, James. There's something very important that we can't overlook. 5, 16, and 17. It says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another so that you are healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous one accomplishes much. I'll stop there before I read 17. Pray for one another so that you are healed. We, we pray for one another because we love one another and we want to support one another, but in doing so, we can be healed. And heal, healing doesn't mean just physical healing. It can mean spiritual or emotional healing as well. We can be in a, a, a slump, uh, a downtime. And the, one of the best ways to get out of that is pray and pray for one another. There are people who have worse needs than we do. We should think of that when we're praying. So pray for one another that you may be healed. Eliyahu was a man with feelings like us, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Eliyahu, it says, was a man with feelings but he didn't let his feelings interfere with his prayer. We all have feelings. I'm tired in the morning. I don't really feel like praying. 
Forget your feelings, you know. Uh, there in the office, I, I, I think there's a feelings bag hanging out somebody made. <laughs> they say crocheted the word feelings. Now put your feelings in the feelings bag and forget about it. You don't need, you don't need to go by feelings. We don't, we can't pray by how we feel. We have to pray at all times, whether we feel like it or not. And by doing so, we will be healed. Now, does Yahweh answer prayer? Well, of course, he always answered. But let's substitute the word answer for response. I'll tell you why. Sometimes we feel we don't get an answer to our prayers. Well, perhaps he's keeping us from something that we shouldn't have. We ask for things not realizing exactly what we're asking for. And so, Yahweh says, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that for you. I don't want you to have it. It'll be detrimental to you. And so we won't get it. Or sometimes... He's keeping something from us that is also bad for us. So feelings are what you don't expect. The, the response is something entirely different. Sometimes response is just total, absolute silence. Sometimes Yahweh will just clam up, it seems. And that's for our benefit. Because we could be asking amiss, or we could be asking for uh, something we, we don't really need. And he's just saying, I'm not going to answer you. We don't have to, by the way, answer every question. We don't have to answer every attack that's leveled against us. We don't have to answer every, we don't have to have a comeback for everything. It's a popular notion in the world today. So I think Yahweh sets that example for us. Now, let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. This is in line with uh, in line with the unanswered prayer since I get over to 26 there okay Matthew 26 uh, verse 39 Yeshua. Um, just prior to his execution, his impalement, he took with him his Talmudim and he, he went off to pray and, and, he, and then he took Kepha and, and, and the two sons of Zabdi and he, he went off to pray. And he, he walked away from them and went to a private place. And he said, Going forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I desire, but as you desire. What is the cup that he wanted to pass? Well, his suffering. See, a cup can be a symbol of a time of judgment or a time of suffering, a time of upheaval, a trial. And Yahshua was a human being as well as Elohim in the flesh. He was a human being, and he had human feelings, just like we do. And I'm sure the thought of what he was going to uh, go through, he knew what he was going to go through, was distressing him. So he prayed that if possible, I could be taken away. And what did Yahweh answer him? Absolutely nothing. And then he says, your desire be done. 
your will be done. So we can pray for things. We can pray against impossible odds. As long as we resign ourselves to accepting Yahweh's will. And by the way, prayer does not guarantee that you'll be safe from danger. We pray to be safe from danger, but we know that some of us are going to be martyred. Some of us are going to be killed for our faith. Some of us are going to be persecuted. And there's a reason for that. Trials and tribulations that we go through, they're not pleasant, but they make us stronger. You know, whatever doesn't kill you, <laughs> that, that old saying. All right. So certain trials can't kill us. But we have to pray through them. Uh, now, prayer has to become a habit. I've heard people say, I, I can't pray. I can't. can't never did. I, I went through an audio book uh, on one of those audio things. And, uh, that you, uh, it was, uh, the book was uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear. That was nice just to be able to listen to it and not strain my eyes. But in that book, James Clear talked about establishing a habit. And he had several criteria. It must be regular and should be, if at all possible, at certain times. So there are certain times during the day when we must set aside time for prayer. And that doesn't have to be long. Actually, I think 15 or 20 short prayers throughout the day work, work for me. Some people, maybe they have to pray longer. But there's, there's no time limit. But the important thing is that we establish a habit. And once that habit is established, then we'll want to pray. And, and what, is, what is praying? It's simply talking to the Father. Just like you and I talk to one another. And we can talk to him that way. And it always helps, by the way, if we pray audibly. Now, of course, if you're out in public and you start praying audibly, that might cause some problems. But, uh, when you're home alone and, and all the distractions are shut off, you can pray audibly. You can pray out loud. And I think that, not that the Father doesn't hear you if you don't, but I think that helps us when we pray audibly. It does something for us. And so one of the things that we must do is make prayer a habit. So when it comes time to drink of our cup whatever it is, we'll say, I really don't want to drink this cup, but your will be done. By the way, uh, cup uh, in the uh, uh, strong concordance in the Greek is number 4221, and it means fate or outcome of a trial. So we all have a cup to drink of that we don't like. So now, how often should we pray? Well, um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 gives us that answer. If we turn over there. One Thessalonians chapter 5. And we'll read um, verse 18 or 17. Pray without ceasing. In all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the desire of Elohim and Messiah Yeshua for you. So pray without ceasing. How can we do that? 
Well, some time ago, I uh, uh, copied down some things that I found in a sudor. I'm not advocating you go out and buy a sudor now, but it was very nice. It was blessings for different things. There was a blessing for the rain, a blessing for a thunderstorm, a blessing for meeting a new person, um, a blessing for meeting a person of uh, a, a Torah scholar, or a blessing for meeting someone who uh, uh, was well educated, a blessing for seeing a, a, a disabled person. There, there's a blessing for everything. And we don't have to necessarily memorize these blessings, but we ha- can put them in a frame of mind. There are so many things that we can give blessings for. We can give blessings for this building that we're in. We're not renting. Before we, we had a, uh, we, we rented a gymnasium uh, from a, uh, a church and we held our meetings in the gymnasium and everything was fine until they got a new pastor and he says, there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> and one day the pastor came in the gymnasium and he looked in our refrigerator and he saw a bottle of wine. And he said, oh, that's it. These people got to go. So, of course, he, he didn't just tell us we had to go. He, he was very subtle. He said, I'm going to raise your rent. And he, he had an outrageous amount. So we said, oh, so long. So now we don't have that problem here. So we should be thankful for that. We should be thankful for all the new people who've come here and for the ones who are coming. We have a new lady coming tomorrow from Florida. We pray that she has a safe trip. We have the Lintons just moved here now. And we have more people coming every every, every week. And, and, and they want to know about the area. They want to know about Beth Shalom. And, and, and they, they've been watching us online, and that's just not good enough for them anymore. They have to be right here where the action is. See? And, and, and so we, we should be thankful for that. And by the way, um, our elder brother Judah... Uh, the, the observant ones, pray three times a day, minimum. The evening prayer is called Ma'arav, and the morning prayer is Shakarit, and uh, the afternoon prayer is called Minka. I, I was at a, a, an airport in Chicago when I, when I went out to marry my wife, and uh, I noticed an Orthodox Jew going through the big airport, and he was saying, Minka, Minka, Minka. He was calling other Orthodox Jews to the afternoon prayer. And they make no secret about it. They, make, they, they don't try to hide it. So we have to pray a minimum of three times a day, but certainly you can pray more often. And you can pray... Uh, about many different things. But there's a lot of advice on prayer in the Psalms. And I like to turn to Psalm 132. And I'll read verses 3 to 5. Well, we'll start in verse 2. How he swore to Yahweh, vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, not to enter into my dwelling house, nor get into my bed, nor give sleep to my eyes, or slumber to my eyelids, until I find a place for Yahweh, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Yaakov. We should make it a rule never to go to bed at night without prayer. And by the way, although the Shema it, it, it could be considered a prayer, it's Israel's confession of faith, we should have the Shema memorized, and it's a good idea to say it three times a day. Let's go over to Psalm 59. Psalm 59, verse 16. 
And I, I sing of your power. And in the morning, I sing aloud of your loving commitment. For you have been my strong tower. And a refuge in the day of my distress. So, Yahweh is for us in times of distress. And sometimes it's, the distress can be so overwhelming, it's easy to forget to pray. But again, this is where habit comes in. We could be in physical pain from an injury. We could have upheavals in our family. We could have quibbles or squabbles among the brethren that distress us. But we have to pray. And Yahweh is a strong tower and says, and he's a refuge in time of stress. Oh, my strength, to you I sing praises. For Elohim is my strong tower, my Elohim of loving commitment. We go over to Psalm 69 and verse 8. I have become a stranger to my brothers and a foreigner to my mother's children. Sometimes we're at odds with family members, biological family members, especially when we're in this walk. We don't see eye to eye. And this time of year, you know what? Ho, 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 holiday is coming up. That puts a tremendous strain on family relations. Not on our part, but on theirs, really. I had somebody come up. How can you deny your kids to celebrate Christmas? How can you deny them the joy of Christmas? And they made me sound like I was some kind of evil ogre because I taught my kids that there's no Christmas. Actually, the first four children I had never grew up knowing Christmas. But my mother, may she rest in peace, I love her. I hope to see her in the millennial reign. When she was alive, my, my, my oldest daughter, Judy, was, I think, about three, three, three years old, something like that. And my mother got a little dig in. She says, well, Judy, what do you want Santa to bring you for Christmas? And I remember Judy put her hands on her hips and she says, Grandma. I'm surprised at your age, you still believe in Santa Claus? Huh? So, so, you know, out of the mouth of babes. And my mother had no answer for that. So, but there's another aspect to prayer too. And that other aspect is meditation. And this is what we covered earlier about hearing the voice of Yahweh. When we're alone and we're isolating ourselves and we're, we're just praying, whether it's for three or four minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is, then just take a little time just to sit there and say nothing. And thoughts will come into your mind if you're in the right frame of mind, the right attitude. And these thoughts that come in are Yahweh's answer. I like, I like to think of the shofar as kind of a prayer. So when Rabbi is through blowing the shofar, you know, he's blowing air out, but air rushes back in. And you can't hear it. You can't see it. That's Yahweh's silent answer. That's the way it is. There's not always a big thunderclap and uh, uh, that, that rattles the windows and, and lightnings and a big voice say, yes, son, I'll answer your prayer. If you're looking for that, you're looking, you're looking in, uh, in, 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 for the wrong thing. An evil and, and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, so let's not always look for a sign when we pray. And again, it, I have to reiterate, it's, it's important to not think of Yahweh's answer as an answer, but as a response. And that way, when Yahweh's silent, we should think about that. Why am I not hearing anything? 
Am I asking for the right thing? Am I asking amiss? These are all things to think about. So, prayer is simply speaking to Yahweh. But listening is also an important part of the picture. And this goes back to asking amiss. How do we listen? Well, we listen to the teachings that are given up here. Or we go online and, and look up some, some other teachings. And by the way, I like the in focus every Friday. They're nice and short, and I often recommend them to people who email us. Somebody emailed us about head coverings. They wanted a short, simple answer. I said, the uncovered woman. It's one of the in focus teachings. So these things can bolster our prayer life. That's part of listening. Um, so we're not going to see visions necessarily. If you do, you might consider your mental health. But uh, although some people have seen visions, uh, we're not going to have some kind of deep spiritual experience. Because if you're looking for these things, then you're going by feelings. And we have to shut off distractions. What are the distractions? Radio, TV, and the internet. Now, the internet can be a really big distraction, and so can TV. We're supposed to watch the news because I think we're supposed to watch current events. But how much news do we have to watch? I mean, do we have to sit there glued to the TV for five or six hours at a time? Now, I have to admit, during this uh, uh, Israeli-Gaza uh, thing, uh, I, I watched TV quite often during that period. I wanted to know what was going on. And, and also, last a couple summers ago, when the riots were going on, I watched more news than I, I normally do. And so, the other thing that can distract us, though, is our frame of mind. If you're upset, if you're angry, if you're depressed, uh, if you've just had a, a, an argument with someone, don't fall in the trap, I can't pray. That's when you need to pray. What if you've inadvertently committed a Torah violation? Some type of sin. You say, oh, well, I can't pray, I've sinned. No, that's when you need to pray. We need to pray that. So let's guard our thoughts. And one thing that we have to guard against is trying too hard. There was a, a, a family member, it's not in faith anymore. But, um, she was all taken with Rabbi Steve's teachings. And she would listen to four or five a day, the marathon. So I said, well, what did you learn? No answer. She couldn't remember one thing. She overwhelmed herself with teachings. So, one of the things that can hinder us, and we're going to turn to Mark 9.24. Again, this, this goes back with, with feelings. Mark 9 and verse 24. We'll start up, uh, actually, um, in uh, verse 18. A father comes to uh, Yeshua, and he, and he, he says, uh, uh, I have a son who has a dumb spirit. In verse 18, wherever he seizes him, he throws him down, he foams at the mouth, and gnashes his teeth, and he wastes away. And I spoke to your taught ones. 
that they should cast him out, but they were not able to. And he answered him and said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into convulsions and falling on the ground, he rolled about, foaming into the mouth. And Yeshua asked his father, how long has he been like this? And he says, from childhood. Well, I think Rabbi Steve explained this, this, this young fellow was having a, a, an epileptic seizure. He was having a series of epileptic seizures. But they didn't know from epilepsy then. He said, they thought, well, he must have a devil in him or something. And he uh, says, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and in the water to destroy him. You know, when you're in an epileptic seizure, you fall down. You don't know where you're falling. If you're going to fall near a campfire or something, you get, or near a hot stove, you get burnt. And Yeshua said, if you are able to believe, all is possible to him who believes. So the father's answer in verse 24 was, I believe, Master, help my unbelief. I think a lot of us have been in that situation where we can say, yeah, I, I believe, but yet my belief wavers. I, I want to believe. And that's where something comes in called bitakon. It's confidence. We have to have confidence that Yahweh will always give us the right response to our prayer. Bitakon. And another way to hear the word of Yahweh is to hear with our eyes. We've already discussed it. How do you hear with your eyes? Read the book. That's hearing with your eyes. Now, again, how often can we pray? Morning, noon, and night. And, and there's no substitute for prayer. Prayer is a lifeline. And if we don't grab a hold of the lifeline, we're going to drown. So yes, Yahweh always hears prayer and he'll always answer. But again, not in the way we, we expect. But we have to have confidence that an answer will be forthcoming. Yahweh has nothing but our good in, in his mind. He wants good for us. He doesn't want to give us anything evil, but sometimes we bring evil on ourselves. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm cursed. Yahweh doesn't curse anyone, really. He allows curses to come, but we curse ourselves. And by the same token, we can, we can bless ourselves by doing things that bring blessings upon us. And one of those things, the most important thing, is prayer. Let's just imagine for a minute that uh, you're cast into prison. Heavens forbid. You're cast into prison, and you don't have your scriptures. You don't have any books. What do you have left? Prayer. Prayer, that's what you have left. Have we thought of Abraham, Abraham Avinu, and Moshe? They didn't have a written scripture. They didn't have a siddur. They didn't have any inspirational books. They didn't even have the internet. Okay. But what they did have was prayer. And Abraham was a very praying man. Because of that, Yahweh revealed to him his Torah. Now, Abraham knew the Torah before it was reiterated on Mount Sinai. And I like to say reiterated because it was already, the Torah was already in effect. 
okay? And in, in Genesis chapter 26, Yahweh tells Yaakov, I'm blessing you because of your father, Abraham, because of what he did. He kept my Torah, my Torah, my laws, my ordinances, my everything. He kept them. He sought them out. And there's another key that we have to realize. Sometimes we have to seek things out. We have to seek out what's right in the Torah. And how do we do that? By reading it over and over and over and over and over. We go through it, the, the entire Torah cycle, every year. Some of the new people have been going through it maybe not quite a year or for a year. And so, some of us have been going through it for several years. And yet, I don't care if, you, if you've been going through the Torah Parsha for 30 or 40 years, I guarantee you when you open your book later today and look at something in the Torah, it'll jump out at you and hit you and say, I, I never realized, I never thought of it that way. When Yeshua was preaching uh, to the people, it says that they were astonished at his teaching. Why were they astonished? Was he preaching something new? Was he saying, well, that Torah, that's a bunch of old Jewish stuff. We're not going to do that anymore. No. He'd have been stoned to death if he said that. He was teaching the same Torah that they heard from childhood. The same Torah that they heard uh, talked about and, and discussed by their, their parents or their, their siblings or their cousins, uncles, aunts, or their, their neighbors. But he was presenting it from a different and fresh perspective. But it was the same Torah. And so this is what we have to discipline ourselves to, to do, is to do, read things over and over and over and over and over. And I can guarantee you that as you're going through any part of the Scripture, Scriptures that you've read before, something will jump out and just present itself in an entirely new light. I, th I see a lot of heads nodding because you, you, you've already done that. So we can't neglect reading the scripture. We can't neglect prayer and audible prayer. If you're all alone, that's fine. And we can't neglect the other aspect, meditation, thinking about prayer. Uh, by the way, some people... Uh, believe in having a prayer closet. And uh, we knew a guy uh, in, in, in Pennsylvania who had a kind of large walk-in closet. And he, he hung his clothes somewhere else. And he put a chair in that closet and he'd go in and close the door. And he said, this is my prayer closet. I pray. Well, that was, that's nice. It worked for him. And some people use the talith as a, as a prayer closet. But your, your prayer closet simply means time alone uninterrupted, time devoted strictly to talking to the Father. And again, let's not just have a bunch of I wants, I wants, I want, I want, I want, I need, I need, I need. Well, the Father knows what we need. But let's praise him. I, I, I've developed a habit when, when I wake up in the morning one of the things I say is, thank you, Father, for allowing me to see the light of another day. That's very important. And I don't know how many days 80 years is, but <laughs> pretty, I, I've been alive that many days. So I'll be 80 in a few months. And it's beyond the three score and ten that we're, that we're allotted. Most of us are anyhow. And so we have to thank the Father for that. You know, we, we, we know in people who died at a very young age, in their 40s and 50s, 
decades ago uh, when uh, Robeson, Joanne, and I were at a Sukkot uh, there. There had been a fella coming there with his wife and children, and we got to know them. But one time he was, he, he was killed. He uh, left for work. He kissed his wife goodbye, as was his custom. And it was on a Friday. He says, don't make anything tonight. I'm getting a, 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 a big check, and I'm going to cash it, and we're all going out to eat. It was in the summer, so you know, sundown wasn't for a while yet. And 45 minutes later, a sheriff a car pulled up to the her door and told her that her husband had been killed at an unguarded railroad crossing. Boom, just like that. So we never know when we're going to be called to make the grave our home. And we have to be ready. We have to be prepared. We have to be steadfast. And again, we have to develop habits. And how do you develop a habit? By consistency, by setting times. Is there anything more important than time for prayer? Well, maybe if your house is on fire and you have to get out of the house real quick, yeah. But is the TV show more important than prayer? Is uh, using the internet more important than prayer? I don't think so. It better not be. Because if it is, you're in trouble. So we have to make time for prayer. And, and it's a good idea if we have as much as possible. I, I know our schedules are hectic and varied. But as much as possible, we have to have a set time in the morning, a set time in the afternoon, the late afternoon, the evening. And I said... Prayers don't have to be long. They can be short and to the point. And, and Yahweh knows our needs, whether we express our need to him in ten words or a hundred words or several hundred words. He gets the point. Sometimes when Rabbi Steve is counseling, uh, People will say something and he'll he'll interrupt them and say, "Okay, I, I get the point. I, I I know what you're gonna, where you're going with this, and here's the answer I want to give for you." So that's the way Yahweh is. We just have to approach Him, thank Him, praise Him, give give glory to Him, and then we can tell Him our needs. But we also have to pray for others, and if we go back to Matthew, or uh, rather Luke, where the uh, so-called Lord's Prayer is, an important part of praying is forgiveness. If we want to be forgiven, we have to forgive people. It's that simple. If we don't, then we're in deep water. I was reading in uh, uh, one of these Jewish inspirational books one time where uh, after, after saying the Shema, that they should uh, pray a prayer forgiving people and asking for forgiveness for themselves. Every night, uh, one rabbi said, I make this a habit every night. I pray to forgive those who offended me and uh, uh, I will uh, uh, pray uh, that I will be forgiven for those I've offended. And that's part of praying for one another. We hear prayer requests up here. People have really genuine, serious needs. Uh, last week, uh, uh, I know Greg Wallen fell off a ladder and injured himself. He had a lung collapse and everything. So I don't know how many were aware of that, but immediately I, I prayed for Greg. He's down in Louisiana. He's, he's an MTR, a good faithful MTR member. And so people have needs. There's, there's a, a lady coming up going to have an eye operation. We have to pray for her. Eye operations aren't serious, but at her age, any operation is serious. So that, that's the purpose of people coming up here. They're not just stating, well, 
I need prayer. But what they're really doing is asking you to pray for them, to join with them in prayer. And joining with one another in prayer is very important, just as important as individual prayer. So, with that in mind, I want to reiterate something. I can't, never did. Don't say you can't. Just get in the habit, just of talking. And eventually the words will come out and you'll say, oh, that, that was easy. I don't know why it gave me such a, uh, I had such a hard time with it. I don't know why it was such an agony for me. It was because you, it wasn't a habit and you, maybe you weren't in the right frame of mind either. So there's no such thing as I can't and let's develop habits. And with that, I'm going to say, Father, thank you for the opportunity to come up here and elaborate on a successful way of communication, which is our prayer. Father, we ask that this message will touch hearts and minds and that we can all learn a lesson from this and go home with a prayerful attitude. And if we don't have a habit of praying regularly, that we can make it a habit. We ask all this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah and Redeemer. Amen.